Well, uh, it's my joy to have Robert Crosby here, and uh, he has written many books, uh, The Teeming Church, he's written The Will of a Man and the Way of a Woman, and last night Becca said, you need that one, so I'm going to get that one, you know, all right, so, and then the book that really introduced us to him before he became the president of Emerge is this one, The One Jesus Loves. Now, about five or six years ago, we did a summer series called The One Jesus Loves. It came from this book. I, I read the book. I enjoyed it so much. I said, I need to get copies for our church. I think I bought every copy in print at the moment and said, let's do it as a summer series. And many of you enjoy that. If you, didn't, if you weren't part of that summer series, I would highly recommend the book. And so it's a, a joy to have him here with uh, the Soul Care Sunday, this weekend experience. And uh, we want you to welcome to our church Church, uh, Dr. Robert Crosby. Can you welcome him today? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Well, good morning, River Valley. So good to be here today. Pamela and I have been familiar with this ministry for a while. And of course, when, we, when I got that, that text, somebody said, there's a pastor in Minneapolis that just ordered 400 of his, your books for his staff. I'm like, what kind of church has that many people on staff? And uh, so I said, put us in touch on the telephone. We talked and uh, we met at a conference shortly thereafter. And I showed him the trailer we had done on the one Jesus loves. He said, you know, I think our creative team could do an even better job. So I say, go for it if you would, and you guys did. You, you've helped us in many ways. We're so glad to be here today. And uh, Soul Care Sunday, we're beginning to do these around the country. Uh, Emerge Ministries is kind of like the special forces of ministry. You know, when people have given up on someone, someone in ministry or someone in life, Emerge is there. We've been around about 50 years, but we're finding a trend. Now people are coming to emerge, not just because of a crisis, a marriage issue, a personal issue, a trauma. They're coming for soul care. They're coming for preventative steps. Two weeks ago, I met with a pastor. He said, hey, my marriage is good. The church is going well. I have a business that's doing well. And I just am concerned that life is going to send something my way that I'm not ready for. And I want to be ready for it. So we respect that. We're grateful for it. So grateful for Pastor Rob and Becca. We love having Becca on the board. And uh, they have been so supportive. Every time I call them, they're helpful, supportive. They stand with us. And so we so appreciate this uh, endorsement uh, this morning and uh, being able to be here with you for this Soul Care Sunday. Well, I want to let you know, I want to share some tools with you today. Part of what we're doing with Soul Care Sunday is taking some of the, the gems of insight that God has given to our team at Emerge, and not, not me, mostly I'm talking about many of our team members that we, we learn from and we work with, and to share some of those with you over the weekend. And uh, I hope there'll be something from God's table for your soul that will be helpful and a blessing to you today. But I want to also let you know about our podcast, Experience Emerge. Uh, you can, you know, look at that. We have a, we're in about our fourth season. So many discussions, conversations around faith and mental health. One of them is an interview we did a, a couple of years back with Pastor Rob and Becca. But uh, there are many resources there. The host of it is one of our clinicians, Matt Kanabi. Used to be a musician for Sonic Flood, and now he's a counselor with Emerge. And uh, just, just some really good tools and insights there that we hope will be a help to you. Well, you know, when you're a child, you're taught to pray this little prayer. Now I lay me down to, I pray the Lord my soul to, if I should die... That's, that's kind of heavy stuff for a little kid, isn't it? If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. So, you know, even a little child, we're telling them, trust God with your soul. But when you're a little child, and sometimes when you're a not so little child, the soul can seem mysterious. You know, what is the soul? What is it exactly? Well, one of the things that we discover is that when life hits you with something hard, you suddenly discover what the soul is. 
a number of years ago, and I have a bit of a unique voice. A number of years ago, I was preaching, pastoring a church in Boston on a Christmas Eve in the middle of the sermon. My voice went out. It was like this. I couldn't get any volume. That's a little frightening. You know, I'm up speaking, and it's like somebody turned the volume all the way down. So Christmas Eve, I shortened my sermon. You know, we had communion. On the way out, people were like, hey, pastor, take care of that voice. And uh, you must have laryngitis, which I'd had before, but always had a clear, resonant voice. Well, over the next several months, from one doctor to another, eventually it was diagnosed. Uh, they had sent me to speech pathologist, you know, speech therapist, all this. And I'm like, Lord, I'm a preacher. You sent me to Boston, and now I'm having trouble talking. We had a visiting evangelist one night, Pastor Rob, and he had the most clear, resonant voice. And he's in my office. He said, man, you sound terrible. And I'm thinking, well, thanks for the encouragement, you know. <laughs> and he said, let me get this straight. He said, you're a preacher and you can't talk. What you going to do, right? Little did he know what he said that had a note of sarcasm struck a prophetic chord. While I couldn't talk, I started writing. Over the next few years, my books were, I wrote and published books that went all over the world. And all of a sudden, I had a voice that I never had before. Little by little, more of my voice began to return. But part of what I had to do, I mean, I had people anointing me with oil. I was the oiliest pastor in New England. <laughs> anointing me with oil, you know, praying over me. And I believe I'm Pentecostal. God can heal me. The Spirit can heal me. God can heal me. But still, it didn't fully come back. So I kept saying, Lord, why this? Why now? Why here? Why me? You ever said that? And I felt like the Holy Spirit began to say, don't just ask why, begin to ask what. Lord, what, if you're not healing me or not healing me yet, what might you want to do through this? So life hit me with something unexpected. Sometimes life will hit us with something we don't expect, the tension in our family, a job loss, uh, a health issue that comes up. I want to talk with you today about the hole in your soul. The hole, W-H-O-L-E, in your soul. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living what? Soul. Imagine the inanimate, almost claymation-like body of Adam lying on the ground, and God breathes into him, and then he begins to move around and walk around, and he becomes animated and alive and, and dynamic in the midst of it. Well, when this challenge hit me, I asked the doctor, is there any way, is there like surgery for this or something? He said, oh, no, the only thing we have is we do injections in the vocal cords. I'm like, I think I'm going to pray about it a little bit more. <laughs> so, so eventually, it was challenging enough, they did these Botox injections in my vocal cords. So I have the best-looking vocal cords in the United <laughs> States, you know, and... I haven't yet, but I've been tempted to say, if you have a little Botox left over, you know, maybe. But, <laughs> but, um, but th that's been one of the things that has hit my life, many different things. Some maybe much more challenging have hit your lives. I was walking out of my office one day, and one of our counselors was coming at Emerge with a couple of grandparents. And he, they had given him permission to share their challenge with me. And he said, Dr. Crosby, and he introduced this couple, and they've shared this story publicly. That's why I share it here. And he said, this is a couple of grandparents. They took their grandson out, five years old, on a boat day trip. Their daughter let them take him for the day. He was sitting in the back of the boat. They're watching him. Everything seemed fine. They're laughing. They keep turning around, checking on him. They turned around. He was lying in the bottom of the boat. They didn't realize the carbon monoxide and the wind of that day was blowing all around him, and he inhaled it, and they were not able to resuscitate him. You talk about something external hitting your internal life. Suddenly, they knew what their soul was. Nobody had to define it because they felt it. Is there enough in my soul to get me through the challenges that I will face? You are more than just a self. You're a soul. God's given you a soul, some, some design to be able to know him and through knowing him for life to become integrated, knit together, life to come together as one in not just wellness. We don't really love the word wellness at Emerge. 
You know, it's so overused today, it feels. There's even a mockumentary on Netflix called Wellness, uh, where they talk about all the different things, essential oils, exercises, all these things. And many of them are well and good. And some of them, you know, we've used and you've used. But we like the word wholeness. Wholeness. God wants you to be whole. He wants you to have a whole mind, a whole soul, a whole family, a whole marriage. Not perfect, but growing toward the wholeness that Jesus can bring. So in a lot of ways, your soul is mission control. You remember the movie Apollo 13. You know, here's this spaceship going up to on a moon landing. That's what they're hoping to do. And on the way up, everything goes awry. Everything goes kaflooey. And they suddenly realize we might not have even enough oxygen to get back to the earth. So all of a sudden, the Tom Hanks astronaut character, he calls up uh, Mission Control. He says, Houston, we have a It's like when something hits my life and yours, suddenly we call down to the inner resources and we say, Houston, we have a problem. There's something on the outside that I don't know if I'll have enough on the inside to be able to weather, to be able to get through, to be able to walk through it. Will I have the wholeness? Will I have what I need? You know, St. Augustine, or we call him Augustine or Augustine, uh, he said this, he said, Lord, my soul is like a house. But Lord, the house is too small. Would you please come and enlarge it? And he said, also, there are things, I must warn you, that are in my house that you will not like. But who else do I have to remove them for me and to help me remove them? My soul is like a house. So uh, Pamela and I, the city we lived in when I lost my voice was Boston. And, uh, and in it, they have a house downtown called the Skinny House. You'll know from this picture why they call it the skinny house. <laughs> it's this wee little house, you know, in Boston, you've got all these larger homes and townhouses, and all of a sudden, there's this little house, and everyone there calls it the skinny house. It is 10 feet wide. So you go inside, about maybe four people like this can stand side by side in this little skinny house. But Augustine said, Lord, my soul is like a house, but it's too small. You know, thank God for churches that are growing, but there's something God wants more than a big church. It's big souls. He wants big souls, people that are magnanimous, people that have love, that love others, that welcome people in. And you know, with a church with big souls, and I believe this is one of them, it welcomes other people. That's part of why there are gonna be more people here on Easter because you're gonna be inviting them because you're thinking about them even today. Lord, I wonder if this could be the year that you touch them and use them and work in them. My wife, uh, Pamela, is here with us today and every now and then Pamela will say, you know, there are times, sweetheart, when you're in the house but you're not really home, right? You know, you're here, you're sitting in the living room or you may be sitting in the kitchen but I don't know if you're really here mentally. (laughs) You know, you, you've got a lot on your mind. You're maybe somewhere else. You're going through different things. Well, we read a lot today about people that are all into turning a house into a home. You know, interior designers, TV programs, shows that talk about this. One writer said the difference between a household, a house and a home is simple. A house is a structure that you live in that provides basic needs and safety but you wanna spend your days in a place that can offer you more than shelter. You wanna live in a home where you feel the mental and emotional support, a place that you look forward to being. She wrote, how do you turn a house into a home? Well, one, make your house into a sanctuary, a place that you will want to be. Also, let it be truly you. I like what Chuck Swindoll said. He said, know who you are, like who you are, and be who you are. I like to say, know who you are in Christ. Like who you are in Christ, and be who you are in Christ. You know, you can go on Instagram and say, oh, I wish I was more like them, wish my house was more like theirs, wish my job was more like his. We don't need another one of them. We need you. We need Christ in you, the hope of glory. The people around your life, you know, On Easter, this place is going to be full of people coming to hear a message. 
Every day you have an audience around you watching a message. The people in your life, your family, the individuals, and you know what? One way they see your soul is how you deal with struggle. How you deal with challenge. How when life sends something unexpected, how do you deal with it? What's, what's in your soul? It shows what is in your soul. But there's also the whole, the H-O-L-E in our soul. You know, Blaise Pascal said that there's a God-shaped vacuum in every person, and the only thing that can fill it is God. Only him. But what do we do? When children are little and they pray to receive Christ, we say, where does Jesus live? And what do they say? In my heart, you know, right here. But what we often do is we live our lives in a way where we look for fulfillment everywhere but there. Success, achievement, knowledge, notoriety, competence, uh, pleasure, dreams, hopes, all these different things. We look for fulfillment and we get there and we're still looking. All the while, Jesus is right here. Your soul can be God's home. You're not just a self, you're a soul. Turn to the person next to you, you are a soul. Tell them, go ahead. You're a soul, not just a self. More than that, you're a soul. There's a difference between self-care and soul care. There's a real difference between those. You know, when I wrote the book, The One Jesus Loves, and I appreciate Pastor Rob mentioning it, if you ask me what, if I could only keep one book in the world I ever wrote, that would be it. Because I told my wife, I said, I don't think I can write on anything more important than intimacy with Jesus. Getting close to Jesus. And I believe the most healthy, spiritual, soul place to be is when you deeply believe that God deeply loves you. Right? When you deeply believe that God deeply loves you. And every morning when you get up and you look in the mirror and you're not feeling so good, or you wake up with worries on your mind, and, you, and we've all done it. How will this, how will our family do this? How will we make it through this? All of these things. Jesus is calling you back home. And then we go to a room to pray for a while, and we might think we have to conjure up God's presence. Lord, if I pray really hard, you'll be here. No, before you got up, he was looking at you. Before you got up, he was praying for you. You come in and you just say, Lord, bring me into the throne room of God. Our bodies get tired, so they need sleep. Our souls get weary, so they need rest. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who struggle and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Take my burden, not your burdens, toss your burdens away. Take my burden, because I'm bearing it with you. Because it's my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. The body breathes oxygen. The soul breathes the presence of God. From the moment that God breathed into Adam, you and I need the presence of God. I talked to a gentleman in Arkansas who had many people in his church die from COVID. And because of it, he got criticized all over the state, all over the state of Arkansas because because of not closing his church enough. And he was overwhelmed. His daughter was sick and pregnant. He was sick. And I said, how have you made it through this? He said, when I don't know what to say, when I don't know what to do, the presence of God. He said, being in the presence of God has helped me. Well, you know, there, there are times we lose things at home. Anyone ever lose things at home? Come on, be honest. You lose things. And, you know, I looked at a survey on what are the things we lose the most at home. One is the car keys, you know. Where are the keys? You know, who knows where they are? And when you lose them, everybody knows. Everybody in the house has to stop whatever they're doing. You know, this becomes the priority. The other is, how about those tiny little um, Apple TV remotes? I'm like, did somebody tell them to make those so tiny that you cannot find them? They fit perfectly between the sofa cushions, you know. But here's what the scripture says. Matthew 16, 26. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what will a man give or a person give in exchange for their soul? 
And I think it might help us to look at the soul of Jesus for a minute. Kind of, I would call him the soul of souls. You know, the one that we can learn from. And in Matthew 8, verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Wow. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and they asked, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? The question was that emerged, what kind of man is this? Say that with me. What kind of man is this? What kind of soul was this who did all these things? You know, when I read this passage, there are questions that arise for me. I don't know about you, but one is, uh, what kind of man would order you to go to the other side? What kind of man would say, you're going this way, but no, now you're going to the other side? Another, what kind of man would have no place to lay his head? What kind of savior would have no place to lay his head? How about this? What kind of man, you heard it with me, would keep a son from his father's funeral? Did that bother anyone other than me? <laughs> what kind of man would put you on a ship heading straight into a storm? Have you ever felt the Lord lead you? You take the step and there's a storm. You know, I, I sort of keep hoping that life is going to have two or three years with no storms. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like Tony Evans has said, he said, you're either in a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're about to go into a storm. <laughs> You know, he's lived a little bit of life. He knows what he's talking about. So it would be wise for we as Christians to have our soul ready for the storm, to be ready to endure it, to be able to get through it, to get through afflictions and challenges. And what kind of man would sleep through your storm? You know, there, there are moments when you've had a problem, you talk with a friend, and it's help, but it isn't enough. Maybe you went to a pastor and they helped you and they said, you know what, I've really given you everything I can give you. I'm a hope giver, but I really believe it would be good for you to consider counseling. How do you know when counseling is something that your soul might need? Some of the indicators, and I'll mention a few. One, you're constantly, constantly feeling overwhelmed. Your physical health is suffering. You're struggling to build or maintain relationships in your life. When it feels impossible, impossible to control your emotions, your anger, your rage, your resentments. You know, how do you know with all these things that you walk through, you're no, you're no longer enjoy the things you used to? Fatigue, apathy, all these things could be indicators of a need for counseling. You know, the scripture tells us how we can work on our joy. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, up until now, you haven't asked anything in my name. Ask, you'll receive, your joy will be full. I want your joy, Jesus said, to be full. Christ has come that we might have life and life to the full. Not just surviving, but thriving, the, the, uh, the overflow. One way to work on joy is singing. Music, putting music in your world, worship music, singing to the Lord, making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's something about that that can bring joy to you and me. Another, another is friendship. Having what we call a pain partner. You know, the truest friends are the ones that there's no worry about sharing your biggest plus, your biggest opportunity, your greatest success, because you know they're going to rejoice with you. Also someone that you can share some of your deepest struggles with that becomes a pain partner in your life. There's also an article on our website at emerge.org that has 11 other ways to work on your joy, 10 other ways to work on joy in your life. But what does it mean to turn this house called 
my soul into a home. What does it mean for that to happen within me? Well, you know, sometimes within the rooms within our house, within our home, uh, sometimes there are rooms we don't really want to go to. How many of you have moved in the last five years? You've moved to a new place in the last five years. You know how when you move and you figure you're never going to get to the last box, you know, when you move, and then you put those boxes in that room and you're still going through them, somebody comes to visit, you tell the kids, don't let anyone go in that room. They can go in all these other rooms, but don't go in that room. When it comes to our souls, sometimes we say, Jesus, come in this room. Come in this room. Come in, come in this Oh, no, no, I, I, I don't want to go there, Jesus. I don't want to go there. You know, before he made a commitment to Christ, Augustine said, Lord, give me purity, but not yet. <laughs> so it's the room we say, I don't want to go there. My experience has been that often the room that we say we don't want to go to is exactly where the Holy Spirit wants to go. Why? Because he wants you free. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It takes courage to go to truth places. And the Lord wants to bring you there. I mean, we, we have some material on our website even about confronting others in a loving way. How do you do that? How do you speak truth in love? How do you do that? Because where truth comes, grace can come. When I say, God, I admit it, my house is empty. I'm not walking with you. When I say, that's just the truth and I admit it, then guess what? The grace of God can fill it. When I say my cup is empty, somebody says, well, let me refill it. That's what God will do. But it takes acknowledging the truth. So what's the room in your life? A little bit earlier, we sang, I will make room for you. It's really nice to sing it, isn't it? <laughs> it's another thing to live it. It takes courage. I will make room for you. Lord, I want you in every room of my life. I want you to be Lord of my whole life, of every part of me, of all that I have, of all that I am. Your soul is your true home. So when you ask the question, what kind of man would order you to go to the other side? Well, maybe it's a man with a certain plan. Maybe it's a man with a certain plan. What kind of man would have no place to lay his head? Maybe it's a man with a certain kind of home. What kind of man would keep, this is the toughest one, a son from his father's funeral? Maybe it's a man with a certain agenda. I believe in that moment there was an imminent need that Jesus was aware of. And he just could not allow this disciple to go back to that funeral. And that was a moment when he just had to say, Lord, I trust you. You know what's best and I don't. I trust you with that room in my life. And it's hard, it's painful, it's difficult, but I trust you. And then what kind of man would put you on a ship heading straight into a storm? How about a man with a certain kind of storm? The disciples looked at the soul of Jesus and they said, what kind of man is this? The storm that comes into your life says, what kind of woman are you? What kind of man are you? What are you made of? When this external storm hits your life, what's within you? Will you have within you that which is connected to what is above you so that you are not overcome by what is around you? Will you have that today that's needed? Church leaders and pastors today are dealing with great challenges because congregants and parishioners and individuals are. You know, our counselors at Emerge are more loaded in their schedule than ever before. But the people they're meeting with are more loaded and overloaded in their lives than ever before. But Jesus wants our soul to be strong. What kind of man, I ask this, would be more concerned about fear and faith than wind and waves? Jesus sleeps and he gets up and he doesn't say, oh no, this, this storm is terrible. No, he said this fear is, is detrimental. <laughs> this fear is detrimental. God wants you to have faith, to, to trust in him, to be able to get through it. So there, there's some soul tools I want to leave you with today. One, one of the most important soul tools that I believe will keep you and me healthy in the Lord. Get ready, get ready. Meditation. Oh, wow, you could have heard a pin drop in here, Pastor Rob. Meditation, you say, is he talking about Eastern meditation, mysticism, all of this? I'm talking about King David. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they're safe. I'm talking about I've hidden your word in my heart so that I don't sin against you. 
I'm talking about Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. His name is Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of what? Peace. In the message, that passage in Isaiah is interpreted this way, the Prince of Wholeness. The Prince of Wholeness, the Prince who wants to give you and me wholeness in our lives to trust him. Here's, a, here's another tool that helps me every day. When your expectations are here and your reality is here, what you have in the middle is stress. Let me say that again. When your expectations are here and your reality is here, what you have in the middle is stress. The only way to reduce the stress is either to lower your expectations or change your reality. And isn't life a little bit of both of those every day? But here's the beautiful part. When your expectations and your reality meet, it's called contentment. It's called contentment. It's called thanking God for what he's given you. But then those people that are full of faith here say, but wait, what about if, what if it's faith? What if the Lord's told me there's something he wants me to do and reality is here? And other people say, you're going to wear yourself out. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm not. Why? Because if it's really faith, guess what's between faith and reality? It's hope. It's hope, and you'll keep believing what God has told you to believe. And if he's told you to believe something, hold on to it. But if it's your expectation and not his, you will weary your soul. You'll weary your own heart through it. So when a storm hits your life and your world, how will you weather it? What kind of man would be more concerned about, wind, about fear and faith than wind and waves? My soul is like a house, but Lord, it's too small. It's too small. I need you to grow it. I need you to, to remove the things that shouldn't be in there and to grow it. Housekeeping is vital. Uh, my wife said keeping a house clean when you have toddlers is like shoveling during a snowstorm. <laughs> Challenging. But soul keeping is what God's called us to, to tend to it. You're a steward of your soul. No one else can really tend to it as you can with God's help. Your pastors can nurture it and feed it. Uh, disciplers and mentors can bless it, but you have to tend to it. It's like a, a house that God has given you to keep through him. The goal of soul formation is really wholeness. I said earlier, there's a difference between self-care and soul care. You hear a lot today about self-care, but then when you read your Bible and Jesus said that we must die to ourselves. So when you say self-care, you say, well, that's, that's not congruent. How do those two work together? Well, here's what, here's what we believe. Self-care is centered on self. Soul care is centered on God. Self-care focuses on wellness, but soul care focuses on wholeness. Self-care says, you know, brokenness in your life, that's just human nature. But soul care says brokenness is also connected to the fall of man and the living in a world that is broken and that needs the help of God. Self-care depends on you. Soul care depends on Christ who's at work within you. Self-care, you help yourself Soul care you yield to God. Self-care is about actualizing your potential soul care, transformation through grace. Self-care is about caring for ourselves. But soul care is about caring for yourself so that you can care for God. You know, whenever you have a free moment, it's like a rest period on a sheet of music. What do we tend to do? We pull our telephone up, you know? Uh, my soul will find rest in you alone. <laughs> you know, and yet Psalm says, my soul will find rest in you alone. I remember one church I was at, and for the altar call, I said, pull your telephones out and turn them off. And I heard, oh. I said, turn them completely off. Not vibrate, completely off. It's for two minutes. And then put them down, put your hands in front of you and say, Lord, my soul will find rest in you alone, in you. I so appreciated all the worship this morning, but that moment of stillness in the presence of God. Didn't you sense something? Your soul needs that. Your mind needs that. You know, people that even study the mechanics of meditation, 
say that meditation creates like a shock absorber in your brain so that when tough things hit them in life, you're ready to deal with them. But guess what? A shock absorber is not just for a deep pothole. It's a stabilizer. It makes the ride more stable all the way in your life. So when you meditate, you can't afford to go a day without waiting on God, meditating even for a few moments in his word because it fills your soul and gets you ready for what God has. You know, when the prodigal son, when he left, when he left with the inheritance, he left a house. He did not learn or realize that it really was a home. There was a, there was a father there who loved him. So when he ran off and squandered all that he had, and he came back, he said, maybe I can just be a servant. Maybe I can just work for my father and I'll have meals. On the porch was the prodigal son's father. And he's looking at him through his fingers. And he said, I think that's my son. I think that's my boy. And he began to run towards his son. Not only did he give him a place to have food, but he said, get the robe, get the ring, kill the fatted calf. And they hugged one another. He buried his head in the nape of his neck. They wept together. That's the father of your soul. That's the kind of father you and I have that you can trust with every room of your life. If you're here and you're far from God, there's a distance and you say, you know, I need to, to open my heart to Christ. I need his forgiveness. I need to know that my sins are forgiven. I need to trust God with all that I am. One person said this, here's the gospel put differently. Jesus said, I'm gonna leave my place. I'm gonna come to your place. I'm gonna take your place. Then we're gonna go back to my place. <laughs> Don't you love that? I'm gonna leave my place. I'm gonna come to your place. I'm gonna take your place. And then joyfully, we're gonna go back to my place. Well, guess what? He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So his place is right here with you right now. I will make room for you, whatever you want to do. Here I, here I am, Lord, I lay this moment in my life down before you. I'm gonna ask every head bowed, every eye closed as we just wait on the Lord in these moments. And I believe there are beautiful things that he wants to do in our hearts and in our souls. And we're gonna sing this chorus as an act of surrender and yieldedness to God. I'm gonna ask us all just to stand together right where we are. And as we do, as we do in this moment, let it be you, let it be your heavenly Father and this house called your soul that he so wants to turn into a home and fill. We ask Jesus into our lives, and when we do, that's powerful and wonderful, but it's just the beginning of what he wants to do. There's a scripture in Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, Jesus' words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, build a relationship with them and them with me. I love that verse for people that might be here that you're asking Jesus into the house that is your soul so that he can make it into his home. But also, do you know that that verse was written to Christians? It was written to believers. It was written to people who had already asked Jesus in, but they were missing the moments of closeness. They were withholding rooms from him in their lives, from the one who said, I want you to live life and life to the full. If you're here and there's a distance from God and you say, I need to open the house of my heart to Jesus. In this moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, just raise your hand. I need to open the house of my heart to Jesus. Put your hand right up and then right back down. Right up and then right back down. God bless you. And then there are those who say, I'm here and I need to open my soul more fully to Jesus. There are places I want to yield and surrender to him. I don't want to withhold anything. I want it to be full surrender to him. If that's you, just raise your hand. Put it right up. Lord, full surrender, every room, every part, every place. We're going to worship the Lord with this chorus and song. Let him minister to you. Share your words of commitment to him today. And watch what he does in your heart this morning.